Welcome to another live Mastering Diabetes webinar. We are super excited to have you joining us tonight. We have a very special guest and a very important topic. We're going we're gonna to learn a lot tonight and go ahead and be active in the chat box and participate. So you can write and let us know where you're coming from. So I'm coming to you from Miami Beach, Florida. We have Dr. Lim joining us. There he is. How are you? Hey, Robbie. Good I'm doing well. You. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Doing very well. Where are you coming from? I'm coming from Santa Rosa. Beautiful. From my Beautiful. home office. Yeah. Do, um, do you get cherimoyas at the farmer's market in Santa Rosa right now? We do not, but we do from my dad's house. Now we're, now we're talking. <laughs> I was just recently in California. And I purchased some cherimoyas. I brought them back to Miami with me. And that is a very special fruit. Is it? Fruit. Pretty exotic. It's so good. It's so My good. dad and mom have like, a, gosh, it, it's a mecca of fruits. I've got like, <laughs> I've got like uh, avocados and oranges. And wow. They brought some cherimoya. And I have to visit this place. This sounds like a pretty solid farm. Del Mar. Del Mar. Okay. Yeah. I know. It's good stuff. I love I'm it. Je I'm jealous. Guys, in the chat box, if you've had cherimoya, write the letter C. Just write the letter C to indicate that you have had cherimoya. I want to know how many people have had this exceptional experience. And uh, we got people coming in from all over the place. We got Ooh. Rachel from Ohio and from Texas. We have Scott from Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, there we go. Claudia says hello from Los Angeles. I love your fruit setup. Hey, I wish I could share the fruit with you all, um, but we'll we'll talk about that another day. Michelle puts a C in the chat box. I like it. I like it. Very good. Dr. Lamb, what's your favorite fruit? Oh, it's a toss up, but it, I'm going to have to put my top three or four. Mm -hmm. Blue, blueberries. Yeah. Watermelon. Mango. Wow. That's a solid list right there. Yeah. If mango didn't make the list, I think we'd have to have a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your number one? I mean, it's up there. It's up there. It's hard. I agree with you. Like, it's hard to say. Like, there's just so many special fruits. Like, you know, but I like the particular varieties, you know, like, you know, the Pantin Mame, the, the tiger, stri tiger Stripe Figs that are red on the inside, like Jam. Wow. The Lisa Cherimoya is particularly special. Not all Cherimoyas are good. You got you to gotta know what the good ones. From the good farms, good variety. Wow. So, you know how you're, at, you're at a level that I can only aspire <laughs> to, Robbie. <laughs> <laughs> That's too funny. Well, um, I know everybody's time is precious here, and we have important information to cover. So, I mean, we are in the presence of uh, a true, true legend here like Dr. Lim. I appreciate you taking the time. And we've had the pleasure of having you at one of our retreats, which was an incredible experience. Oh, that's good and time. you've been you know, working in this space for, for many, many years now and, and really bring to the table like, a lot of experience. And obviously worked very closely with Dr. John McDougall. You know, got to you know, pick his brain over many years. So we're really excited to have you here with us tonight. And I'll let you share your screen and, and really take it away. Awesome. Do I just press the big computer? Yep, yeah, press the big computer and then click like share your entire screen. It usually works best. Um, and then just make your slides full screen and you're good to go. There it is. Perfect. Awesome. All right. All right, folks. So today we're going to um, talk about breaking the pattern of emotional eating. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a board certified family physician. Uh, and I have the, the privilege and honor of serving as the medical director of the McDougal program. Um, I've been in this role for uh, coming on seven years since 2015. Uh, I, I also lecture at uh, True North Health Center, um, as well as uh, Kaiser here in Santa Rosa, which is one of the largest managed care organizations in the U.S. Um, and... Uh, in my seven years now, uh, coming on seven years as medical director of uh, the McDougal program, I've seen some pretty um, outstanding uh, results uh, and people really, uh, I mean, it's like a miracle, right? Literally seeing chronic illnesses 
uh, reverse before your very eyes in a matter of a few weeks. Um, since COVID, we pivoted from our in-person program, which we ran out of um, the Flamingo Conference Resort uh, here in Santa Rosa, and we are 100% online. And um, we actually just finished a 12-day program uh, yesterday. Um, and literally, uh, we had one patient who came in on two blood pressure medications um, who is off everything with a blood pressure of 107 over 63. Um, uh, another one who came off of uh, two blood pressure medications with a blood pressure of 125 over 65. Um, and in on top 12 of that, days, in 12, 12 days, days, Dr. Lim. It's crazy. Another <laughs> diabetic patient. This is up your alley, Robbie. Yeah. yeah. Came in on uh, metformin um, as well as uh, lisinopril, or sorry, losartan. Yeah. Um, for blood pressure. She's 58 year old female. She's off both her losartan uh, and her metformin with a fasting blood sugar of 118, which is, uh, you know, as many of you know, just under the threshold of diabetes um, diagnosis, which is 126. So she's off all medication with a, a blood sugar that doesn't even meet criteria for mm -hmm. diabetes. And she lost 8.8 .8 pounds um, and has well-controlled blood pressure off her medication. So uh, I, I, I pinch myself. Um, I, I tell people I'm like a kid at Disneyland because this is why um, doctors go into medicine is to heal their patients. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, as I uh, experienced during med school and residency, my, my paradigm for the care of patients, um, I, didn't, I had never heard the words whole food plant-based. Mm. Uh, despite seven years of, of, of med school and residency. So my paradigm was management, right? That, that, you know, it's like, yep. all right, let's metformin is not working. Let's add on glipizide. Well, we're, we're not getting it with those two, you know, maybe we'll add one of these new fancier ones, um, or we'll just go straight to insulin. Mm. Um, and the more complicated the patient, the more meds we put on, the more you kind of got a sense of, uh, uh, you know, you got a pat on the back for managing a complex patient. Mm. And, and now, uh, as you can, as you all can probably sense my, my paradigm is uh, reversal. <laughs> yeah, it's a completely different mindset. It's a completely different mindset. Absolutely. And um, I do want to say, you know, I, I really appreciate that you guys have, you know, obviously COVID sort of forced you to go online, but I think it might, you guys might agree, but it's a benefit in disguise. Like uh, it, it allows more people to access the program and also learn how to do this in their own home environment where they need to maintain it long term. Yeah, absolutely. It, you know, it's interesting. We've actually had higher weight loss during this 12 day program on average than we've had than we did during the in person program. Wow. And that was not, we were not expecting that. The average during the in person program was about three pounds. Mm -hmm. um, but like this last program, the average was four, uh, 4.6 pounds, almost five pounds. Wow. Um, and we think that a big reason is that people are in their home environment, learning to do it themselves. Um, and their confidence level, you can just sense it. It's higher at the end of the program because, um, they've had to do it themselves. Whereas, um, you know, it was considered one of the perks, but in retrospect, now it's also, you know, in a way, not necessarily forcing the patients to do it themselves. They got a buffet spread three times a day. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, they, they show up and it's amazing food. And, you know, it's, it's nice because they get to try all the different things, but they didn't have to make it. Um, right. And so there, there would always be a little bit of trepidation as they were headed back to their, to their sure. home environment. Absolutely. Um, so anyways, uh, you know, I'm wearing my McDougal shirt right here. This, you know, <laughs> Dr. McDougal is famous for this line. It's the food. Yep. And there's no question, as you can see, right? 12 days, we're seeing reversal of blood pressure, diabetes, and, and s significant weight loss um, eating. And mind you, this is not portion control, right? We were, we not once did we tell the 30 participants in this last program that they can only eat so much calories. Mm. Uh, not once did we say you have to put your portions and have it fit inside, you know, the palm of your hand. Um, we said, eat as much as you want, just eat the right foods. And, and here they are, right. Mm. You know, a, a, a plethora of starches, 
um, legumes, uh, fruits, vegetables, and uh, no oil, no, no animal-based products. Um, but I would be lying if I, had, if I said that 100% of patients who you know, do the McDougal program are forever you know, uh, free of their um, unhealthy eating patterns and uh, off and on their way without chronic illness. I've seen over these six plus years, the whole spectrum and I am uh, someone who deeply cares um, about my patients. I, I really want their long-term success. And so uh, over the years, as I followed up with patients, when someone is struggling, um, I always, you know, the big question that's kind of, you know, big capital letters in my, in my mind is why, hmm. you know, why, if this is so simple, um, you know, so straightforward, not complicated, and you got to eat as much as you want. Why, why is this not taking hold? And every time I kind of dig a little bit beneath the surface, the one unescapable, unescapable conclusion I've come to is that it's not because of a knowledge deficit. Hmm. It's not that they suddenly forgot that potatoes, rice, beans, and cauliflower were good for them. And started to think that really they need to be eating, you know, hamburgers and, you know, French fries or um, go, go, moving on to a, a ketogenic diet or, or a, a paleo diet. It, it, it wasn't that they forgot the basics of, um, of the McDougal plan. Over 90% of the time, it was due to um, their behavior, that they had difficulty putting into practice what they knew to be good for them. Right. right? It came right. down to the behavioral change piece. It came down to changing um, their habits around, which maybe they had some success in the initial period, but then over time life happens and um, they, they would lapse back into their old ways. And then taking it one level beneath that, why did they have trouble changing their behavior? a huge thing that came up again and again was emotional eating. Yeah. And just the, 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 their lives and the unexpected twists and turns it took, um, upsetting what they knew to be good for them, uh, and, and, and going back to their old ways. And here's just a couple, I just got a few excerpts from emails that, um, I've received, uh, dear Dr. Lim, there's just an excerpt. I, I um, have given a lot of thought uh, and I realize that I suffer from emotional issues, sabotaging my efforts at eating better. I know there may be deep issues I don't want to uncover subconsciously. Uh, I do know that my family celebrated food and celebrated through food, right? Now we're going back to childhood uh, memories. Every event, good or bad, was an occasion for lots of greasy and sweet food, fried chicken, potato salad and the most decadent cakes imaginable. Uh, another one, um, I struggle with food as an emotional addiction and I always have. I'm a single mom of two boys. My 24 year old has quadriplegic cerebral palsy and mental retardation. He has a seizure disorder and uses a wheelchair and needs 24 hour care. I work 32 hours a week at my day job in public health. I have a lack of staff and I'm putting in 67 hours this next week and a half taking care of my son. Would it be hard to imagine that this individual struggles with immense levels of stress and feelings of overwhelm and uses food as an outlet? Yeah, can only uh, imagine. And, and is it possible that even though they know rice, beans, uh, potatoes, and cauliflower are good for them, that may not be necessarily what they go to when they feel hijacked? Mm -hmm. I think it's possible. So you can see for patients like this, if we don't help them shine a light on the emotional eating aspect of their life, they could keep thinking there's something fundamentally wrong with them when maybe it's just that they're not seeing um, uh, the, the true problem underlying some of their behaviors. Mm -hmm. uh, one more here is, um, uh, this is truly, Dr. Liam, this is a truly a trying time, but I know I'm motivated to go through this as best I can. I know that the impulse is to rush into something that feels safe. What do we think that is? Food. Yep. Food. Right. Comfort but I'm also food. aware that safety can be an illusion and I would run the risk of missing an opportunity for personal growth and health. 
So for now, I'm going to just sit tight and feel my feelings and be open to self-reflection. I'm glad that I didn't turn toward emotional eating today and in turn know that I'm capable of doing so again tomorrow and the next day and so on. I admire your devotion to helping your patients achieve physical and emotional health rather than just focusing on one piece of their puzzle. Um, one I just uh, received uh, recently, uh, I spoke with a patient and um, it, 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 uh, her email to me previously, she was a former McDougal participant who had done incredibly well, um, uh, lost significant amount of weight, got her cholesterol down by over 40 points, um, dropped her, uh, her fasting blood sugar uh, significantly, um, and then was coming back a few years later because everything had gone out of control. And uh, here's what she wrote. I know better. I know so much. And yet I still let myself go. I let my bad habits take over. I know why this has happened. And it's di a direct result of a marriage separation and not caring. Mm. Um, her, she and her husband, uh, after 39 years together, wow. separated. Wow. Uh, and that totally um, threw things for a wrench. Sure. So that's just, that's a small sampling um, of, of, yeah. of the emails or the kind of comments I get. And it leads to this, uh, this quote that I think really captures what I'm talk talking about. Diets so often fail because they offer logical nutritional advice, which only works if you have conscious control over your eating habits. It doesn't work when emotions hijack the process, demanding an immediate payoff with food. Mm. You know, I, I, I would bet if, if we had time and we did a poll, 90% of you out, out there, because you've been, you know, schooled in with, with Robbie and Cyrus in, in this uh, incredible way of eating, rationally know that this is the way to go. And this is the way that you should eat for the rest of your life to optimize your physical, mental, emotional, bodily health. But that's a, that's a rational, logical way of thinking about it. And what we need to appreciate is, do we ever act in a way that doesn't fit with rational, logical, you know, um, uh, advice? Yes. And, and when is that? When we are highly emotional. Right. When mm -hmm. we're highly emotional, because that we kind of flip into this different part of ourselves that isn't necessarily listening to that voice of, of rationality. And literally, I think we can all attest to times in our life when we've been so emotional that it's kind of hijacked us. Um, and we've done things perhaps that we regretted or or we wish we hadn't done. And so we need to shine. The goal of today is really to increase our awareness of this, because Emotional eating is not something that's talked about a whole lot. Um, and so what my hope is, is to inc increase awareness of it and just begin to start to think about ways that we can grow and develop uh, in this area. All right. So, uh, you know, in the time we have, I want uh, all of us to understand what it is and how it affects us. Actually identify if this is something you struggle with and, and to what extent. And then uh, just uh, start to learn some simple steps for beginning to improve in this area. Um, I would say the one thing about emotional eating is that it very much is a journey. Um, it's not something I think that, you know, okay, these next two weeks, we're going to do emotional eating. And by the end, you'll, you'll be, you'll have conquered it. Uh, from my experience, it's something that you kind of start to move in that direction, start to gain a better awareness and understanding of yourself, start to um, increase your alternative coping mechanisms, uh, have a bunch of experiments where you try different things, fall down, get back up. Um, and then over time, you, you just grow uh, in this area. All right. So what is it? You know, there's a lot of definitions, but if we just think about it at a real intuitive level, it's basically when we eat not due to hunger, right? We're not eating due to true actual physiological hunger, but really in order to escape or to numb or to alter our feelings. And usually, typically, they're uncomfortable feelings, right? Boredom, stress, uh, anxiety. Um, you know, that, that person I mentioned at the beginning who separated after 39 years, there was 
deep feelings of loneliness um, and sadness over that. And uh, food was how she numbed those feelings or, or sometimes escaped uh, those uncomfortable feelings. Now, I want to make clear, it's not, I don't think that emotional eating per se in and of itself is, is uh, a, a bad thing. I mean, there are, you know, eating is a very joy, joyful activity. I get very excited when I sit down for one of my meals. And um, sometimes even eating treats when you're, you're feeling down, that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? I, so I think there's, you know, it's not like sort of black and white, but I think there's this sense of what we what might deem to be acceptable versus unhealthy emotional eating. And, you know, I can't give an exact uh, dividing line, but I think factors or considerations that you would keep in mind is one is, is the frequency, you know, is do you tend to eat for emotional reasons like on a regular basis um, when you're feeling down or, or anxious? Or is it, is it occasional? Um, is, you know, I, I asked this question in the pre, uh, pre-program questionnaire that I hand out, which is on a level scale of one to 10, what is your level of stress? What would you say? And then what is your, how do you cope with that level of stress? I have so many people that put a super high level of stress, eight, nine, 10, and their coping mechanism they put is eat. That, that is how they cope. Um, and they don't have anything else listed there. Um, so certainly if you don't have any other coping mechanisms, that could lend itself more to unhealthy emotional eating. Um, and then also just the, your overall um, health, you know, or what, what sort of chronic conditions are you dealing with that might um, make, uh, um, you know, emotional eating have an even greater toll or, or cost on your overall health. Okay. So I don't, I don't want you to think that the occasional time that if you eat a certain food and it helps lift you up, that that's a bad thing. Um, it's just that, is that the only thing you can turn to? Is this something you do frequently? Um, are you suffering from other conditions that would make, you know, frequent um, uh, occasions of this more costly? Um, and, you know, you kind of get a gestalt picture after, or I get a gestalt picture after talking with a patient uh, on just how big an issue it is. Uh, it's problematic for a number of reasons, right? Uh, if you're eating not due to hunger, but due to trying to numb or avoid uncomfortable feelings, it's you're going to be taking in more calories than is necessary. Uh, and so weight loss is going to be difficult. And considering that 70% of all U.S. adults are overweight or obese, that's a problem, right? Considering that coronary artery disease is the number one killer of men and women in the United States and globally, that's not, uh, does not bode well. Um, it's also problematic because it frequently, what we find is this cycle, right? When people uh, eat um, due to negative emotions, that doesn't tend to make them feel better. It might make them feel better in the moment, but uh, usually one day later, they're feeling a sense of shame um, or guilt. And that puts them into a lower, even lower state or even more anxious state, which sort of sets them up for this kind of uh, negative cycle. And uh, in, do, in engaging in emotional eating, they're preventing themselves from learning other happier coping mechanisms uh, to deal with, with adversity. And last, Food does not fix emotional hunger, right? People, people try to fill a void that they feel inside through food, but we all know that that food does not fill that void, right? And you, you can't fill an emotional void with um, uh, uh, physical food. Now, it, part of the reason we do is because it offers us that momentary sense of comfort but uh, it is not a good long-term solution to, to your problems. And then that, that begs the question, well, then if we know it's not good for us, right? And, and I think most of us do, then why do we still do it? Um, there's a number of, of explanations, but just a few. First, the, uh, there's a biological reason. Um, many of uh, us lead 
chronically stressed out lives, um, right? Either due to, you know, our work or our career, or uh, as you heard from that um, email I received, the uh, her the, the person who works as a nurse and uh, has a um, uh, special needs child. Uh, so their family situation, uh, you put it all together, their levels of cortisol are chronically elevated. Um, and we know that uh, chronically elevated levels of cortisol is, are actually going to increase your cravings for high calorie foods that are filled with fat, sugar, and salt. So there's actually a biological drive due to this chronic stress. Um, Dr. Doug Lyle, who is uh, it, you know famous, uh, esteemed psychologist and um, wrote The Pleasure Trap along with uh, Dr. Goldhammer, um, he talks about the pleasure trap and the, just this idea that we are in this food environment where the foods that we eat are not the foods that, um, you know, we, we used uh, to eat uh, uh, long ago. Uh, instead, they're um, highly processed, filled with fat, sugar, and salt. And, you know, we get a certain level, like dopamine hit when we eat these foods. And so they, they literally um hits the same pleasure pathway that drug drug use and alcohol and tobacco all hit so there really is an addictive nature um to it um on top of that we're in an environment where it's so easily accessible right 24 7 anytime anywhere and ads just everywhere when you know watch the super bowl or watch any uh, uh, uh show and you're constantly being bombarded with um, advertisements, not for generally, not for healthy um, plant-based foods, but for fast food and, um, you know, the latest and greatest creation, like, um, what is it, you know, pizza that now has cheese inside the crust because pizza, cheese just on top loaded with cheese is, is not enough. I mean, we keep having to up the ante to, um, uh, to address our, our uh, addictive tendencies. Food is also challenging because it's, it's illegal and it's socially acceptable. In fact, everyone's doing it and everyone has to do it. Um, so it has that imprimatur of, of uh, acceptability that maybe things like say drug use or, or excess uh, alcohol consumption uh, may not have. Um, it distracts us from unpleasant feelings and emotions. People don't, we don't, generally like to feel down um, or anxious and we'll do anything to sort of move away from that and distract ourselves uh, from it. Uh, food is very uncomplicated, right? Doesn't talk back. Um, you don't have to make an appointment. It's just, it's there for you uh, whenever, whenever you need it. And then um, one more uh, reason is I think that we live in an increasingly disconnected uh, culture and society. Um, Dr. Dean Ornish, uh, he's, he's talked quite a bit about this and, um, he, uh, if, if all of his interventions involve a support group, uh, for this very reason of this lack of connection, um, the idea being that if we're, if we are feeling connected, we're going to, our need to turn to things like food to address our emotional, um, distress would, would likely lessen. And in our program, um, we've really made an effort to keep it, you know, relatively small so that we're able to um, have a sense of community even during the 12 days. And that oftentimes is a highlight for people because they know that other people are, are struggling with similar issues or getting other ideas. And that connectedness helps to further their, their commitment to the uh, healthy behaviors. It's uh, one thing that's important is to learn the difference between emotional versus physical hunger, um, because the more aware you are, then you can actually start to like, oh, OK, this feeling that I'm getting I, that I've always thought was because I'm hungry. I, if I really think about it, it's not true physical hunger based on, you know, what I know to be the differences. So what are the differences? Well, let's look at physical hunger. Um, you know, I. I, I when when I eat my, I usually eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I don't tend to snack in between. Um, when as my hunger, you know, increases over the course of the morning or the afternoon, it tends to be gradual, right? 
Um, if you told me I can eat at noon, 12.30, 1 p.m., usually all of those are, are fine. I might get a little bit hungrier, but it can wait. Um, I am open to a wide variety of options when it comes um, you know, to food. If you, uh, my favorite breakfast is um, steel cut oats with bananas, blueberries, and uh, uh, walnuts. But this morning I had a kale, cucumber, spinach, banana, mango smoothie with unsweetened almond milk. Um, if, uh, you know, if I was at the McDougal program and they had their uh, no oil hash browns, I would have happily enjoyed that. You know, I'm, I'm open to a wide variety of options, okay? Um, uh, generally with physical hunger, you're able to stop when you're full. You don't feel this need to keep going, right? You hit your satiety point and that's enough. And then a really good clue is that how you feel after is uh, uh, tells you something. So I feel great, you know. I feel great after my my breakfast and my lunch. My lunch was rice porridge. <laughs> uh, I basically had uh, rice porridge with Chinese vegetables. Um, I feel energized. Uh, I feel pleased. Um, I and I feel satiated to kind of get me through this day. I haven't haven't had any food since I ate lunch at like 1 p.m. Um, and we're at 4.30 p.m. here on the West Coast and I'm, I'm good. You know, by the time 6.30 comes around, I'll be ready for dinner. So that's, that's you know, that's a typical physical hunger uh, sort of uh, trajectory o- over the course of a day. Compare that with emotional hunger, which oftentimes it's not gradual. It comes on suddenly right? Usually there's some sort of trigger and you feel the need to eat and you need to eat now. Like this is not something that can wait. Um, And typically you are not open to uh, a a wide array of options. I'm I'm really hungry. And what I need to eat is uh, potato chips, you know, or or I'm really hungry and I must have, um, you know, I don't know, uh, a a kind bar or or, um, a a bowl of ice cream. I mean, there's a a piece of chocolate. You know, there's usually a very specific food and only that food will do. That is a good clue for you that you are in the land of emotional eating and not true physical hunger. Um, Oftentimes, if you just think about it, if you're trying to uh, fill an emotional void with food, it's hard. You're never going to fill it. Right. So what do you tend to do? You tend to overeat because you're never really able to satisfy the true need, um, that you, you are feeling. Um, and, uh, and so oftentimes you're going to overeat and not, and, and even then not feel satisfied. And one of your best clues to the fact that you, you know, uh, engaged in unhealthy emotional eating is if afterwards you feel a sense of, of guilt, um, or even shame, uh, because that kind of is is your body telling you mm, that you kind of went against what you had, what you knew to be best for you. All right. So if you kind of look at these all together, I think hopefully you're going to start to be able to label and identify better the kind, the different kinds of hunger um, you might feel. Uh, does that guarantee you won't engage in it? No, but just by increasing awareness, that's part of the battle. You can't, you can't fix what you're not aware of, right? So the the first step is absolutely awareness. Um, it's a good time to just ask yourself, well, you know, is this do I do I struggle with emotional eating? And and here's a series of questions. Um, you know, uh, the more that you answer yes to, the more likely it is that this is a real problem for you. Uh, do you eat more when you're feeling stressed? Do you eat when you're not hungry or, or even when you're full? Do you eat to feel better, to calm and soothe yourself when you're sad, mad, bored, anxious? Uh, do you oftentimes snack without thinking? Do you snack after dinner? Do you reward yourself with food? Do you regularly eat until you've stuffed yourself? Does food make you feel safe? Do you feel like food is a friend? Do you feel powerless or out of control around food? Do you occasionally feel a sense of guilt or shame after eating? Oops. So again, that 
uh, answering one of these does not mean, oh, yes, uh, I, I'm an emotional eating. But the more that you answer, the more that it's likely a problem for you. And the way I think about emotional eating is it's not like you're either an emotional eater or you're not. I really think that it's a spectrum. And uh, for some, it's a, a big issue. For some, it's not an issue at all. And then you've got everywhere uh, in between. All right. Um, if I have time, I'll even tell you my story um, towards the end that I have my own history with emotional eating. Um, and people are always surprised to hear that. And this was even during my time, during my time as medical director. So you've got the medical director of the Medjugorje program who was dealing with emotional eating. So I'll talk more about that at five time at the end. We'll make sure we have time. All right. All right. Robbie will. Robbie Absolutely. Will we'll, we'll get there. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> I think it's helpful to just kind of understand typically, again, there's, it's not always the case, but oftentimes the, the pattern that emotional eating follows, there's usually always some form of triggering event. It's an argument with your spouse. It's a, a day, uh, a, a bad day at work. Um, it's unfortunate news that you received about, uh, um, a friend or family member. It's the world politics, uh, which <laughs> given all that's happened in the last few years, I wouldn't blame anyone for that being a triggering event. Um, uh, just this last program, we had someone who has been profoundly affected by the events going on in Ukraine. Um, and enough that it is affecting his ability to eat on plan. I mean, it, it, was, it was like right there. He's can't, it, it can't get his head around it. And one of, one of, one of his coping tools is, is, is food. Right. And so this is, uh, it's, it's some form of triggering event for each person. It's different. And so understanding your own event, tr what your triggers are is part of it. Oftentimes we'll have distorted thinking around it, right? It's this sort of all or nothing mentality. You, you get in an argument with your spouse and then it's like, oh, my, my, you know, my, our marriage is over or I, I'll, I'll never be good enough. It's kind of this always never catastrophic kind of language that if it were really true, it, no, no wonder you're in such a pit of despair. But Oftentimes, your thinking during these periods is not really that accurate. And that's why the whole field of cognitive behavioral therapy um, a, as a form of therapy is so has taken off because it's taking our distorted, uh, irrational ways of thinking and bringing some um, pressure testing these thoughts and so sort of helping to replace those thoughts with more reasoned ones, such as like, okay, we got in an argument today, but, you know, for the last three weeks, we've been getting along really well. Every, you know, every marriage has their their uh, disagreements, and and so we're going to work through that, right? Both are that that is a all of, everything I said is probably is is true, and yet you could instead just focus on the fact that you argued and oh, this marriage is over, right? The the different same event, but two people can take their lines of thinking in completely different directions. Could the direction that they take those lines of thinking affect their emotions and then their behavior after that? Absolutely, right? If they kind of go into the all distorted way of thinking, then they're going to they're gonna feel down. They're going to feel anxious. They're going to feel lonely. Um, if, if food is their primary coping mechanism, then they're going to have a, a strong urge to eat. Like a reflex. It's like... You know, it's like the patellar patellar reflex that you hit the patellar patellar uh, patellar tendon of the knee, and poof, the knee shoots up. That's what it's like with emotional eating. Once you feel that emotion, you're hijacked, right? You haven't learned healthy ways of coping with these emotions. They're overwhelming. It's like a tsunami that's hit you, and you're off to the races. You're in the cupboard. You're in the fridge. You're in the freezer. You're overriding your satiety mechanisms. You don't care. And a few hours later, you feel even worse. Gosh, I can't believe I had been doing so well. Um, I attended the program. I was, I'd lost all this weight. And uh, what's the point now? I knew I couldn't do it. You, you, you give up and you're just that much more vulnerable to the next triggering event, right? And that is the cycle in a nutshell that I see um, happening with my patients. 
There is hope in the last 10 minutes. There is hope. All is not lost. I actually, I, I will tell you that one of the reasons I am so fascinated by emotional eating is because I think it is such a launching pad for total like inner transformation. You know, I mean, plant-based eating is amazing in terms of dealing with chronic conditions and um, even regulating a lot of the, the, um, um, the hormones and the biochemistry so that people even start to feel better. Um, but when it comes to uh, emotional eating, it, 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 it's sort of opening the hood on our inner landscape, right? What's going on in the mind? What's going in the, uh, on in the heart? Um, and how do we deal with the, the challenges and problems that come our way? Um, and if we haven't been dealing with them in a healthy way, then I think that emotional eating is sort of that trigger for us to really seriously evaluate our lives and, and ask ourselves, how, how do I want to face um, the things that I have difficulty facing and in a, in a way that's, that's healthier than drowning my sorrows in unhealthy food? Um, and I think a basic principle that I think is good to consider as we deal with emotional eating comes from uh, this uh, famous gentleman, Viktor Frankl, who uh, is a survivor of a um, uh, Holocaust camp and uh, a psychiatrist who wrote a book, Man's Search for Meaning, on how he managed to survive. And a lot of it was this idea that no matter how dire his circumstances were, and uh, clearly incredibly dire in a, in a concentration camp. The one thing that could never be taken away from him was, was his ability to make, to choose, to choose his response to the adversity he was facing. And so this quote from, from him, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. And I just think that's a good overarching principle to think about as as I kind of go through these, um, you know, simple, simple tips for dealing with this, because as powerful as your emotions are, if you can create a little bit of space between your feelings and what you automatically have tended to do in the past, that space is powerful for for uh, your power to choose your response, okay, and and taking a different path than you have uh, all along, and and as you start to do so, you start to experience a certain growth and freedom that you haven't um, experienced up until now. So I'm gonna quickly go through ten strategies. This is just kind of a hit list, just to give you some concrete things to think about. Um, and uh, uh, and perhaps starting to make progress in this area. All right. The first is continue to eat a healthy whole food plant based diet. You know, in the McDougal program, we say continue to eat a healthy McDougal diet. And the reason is, it's not uncommon that we see some people, many people's cravings and the emotions they feel around food. It does oftentimes go away when you are eating really healthy food that's high in fiber. Um, because some people say they just felt hungry all the time, you know, trying jumping from one diet to another diet. So if you add feeling hungry all the time to some of the, you know, stressors and emotional issues people are dealing with, it's a, it's a, you know, you've got a storm on your hands when you just start to eat a, a diet that you don't have to restrict the amount that you eat, you're getting high fiber, high water content, and you're feeling full and satiated for the first time in your life and, and without, without feeling guilty, it's amazing. It's amazing, right? And so that in and of itself can have a huge healing power um, over um, uh, emotional eating and cravings for, for certain food. So I wanted to state that at the, at the very outset. All right, number two is something that my patients are not so good at. Okay. And, and, um, which we're not, I don't feel like we, we spend a lot of time or attention on, and this is really starting to understand your hunger cues, um, better. And, and it's this idea of practicing, literally practicing eating when you're hungry and stopping when you're satiated. It's, it sounds so simple and yet so few people actually do this. 
uh, Dan Butner, who uh, you know wrote the Blue Zones, these areas around the world where people live past the age of a hundred, you know Loma Linda, California, um, Okinawa, Japan, Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica, uh, Ikaria, Greece. Um, the he he found a lot of things they shared in common. One of them was they all ate a, a, a whole food plant based diet. But another one was what this thing he called hara hachibu, in, 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 which in Japanese means basically eating until you're 80% full. And we tend to eat until we're stuffed, you know, uh, and, and that, that discipline of eating until you're satiated, let's call it an 8 out of 10 fullness rather than a 10 out of 10, makes a big difference makes a big difference, a few hundred calories easily. And so I don't care if you're eating cauliflower and potatoes. I'm going to tell you to eat as much as you want. But I would say, learn to stop when you are eight out of 10 full, as opposed to to stuff. Because I see people, I mean, I'm guilty of this. I When I first started up at True North and, and um, the McDougal program, it's a buffet spread both places I went <laughs> and um, it's visually appealing. And I had that classic problem of putting too much food on my plate and I didn't want to waste it. So I would eat it. I would eat everything. Um, and I would oftentimes walk away from the table like, oh, and it was kind of like, well, OK, sure, it was really healthy food, but I still don't like this feeling. So what all this involves is really this simple exercise of starting to check in with yourself before, during, and after eating. You know, before eating, you just ask yourself, how hungry am I? You know, if, if uh, eight out of 10 is satiated and, you know, 10 out of 10 is stuff, then one out of 10 means you're starving, right? You don't want to wait to the point that you're starving. You, you know, ideally, you want to eat when you're like a three- Four, four out of 10 when you're hungry, but not starving. Um, and then eat slowly, right? Over the course of the meal, because it takes about at least 20 minutes for the signals from our stomach to feed back to our brain to say, hey, you've had enough. So if you eat really fast, you're going to be, you know, overriding your satiety mechanisms, right? You, you won't even be giving them time to feed back to you until, 30 minutes later, and we've all, I'm sure we've all experienced this when we ate fast and we ate more than we should have. And so we didn't feel the bleh until 25, 30 minutes later, right? So you want to eat slowly. And then as you're eating, eating mindfully, you want to check in and say, huh, okay, I could eat more, but I'm not hungry anymore. And, you know, the word, I, I do feel satiated. I think now's the time to push, you know, step away from the table. And just this very exercise of starting to check in more and more with your body and your hunger signals, your awareness is going to shoot up and you will probably find that you eat less food. Okay. Um, I have this, uh, make sure you avoid getting too hungry. Um, I'm not, I don't want to get into it because it's a detour, but intermittent fasting, right? This idea of narrowing the window of hours that you eat during the day. I think there's benefits to it, but my always my one concern with that is if as a result of narrowing the, the food window during which you're eating, you, you tend to get hungrier and maybe make poorer choices when you do eat, then that's not good. Okay. Then I would rather you just eat three square meals a day and avoid um, allowing yourself to get to that point. Um, also, just find when, you, you know, start to do this when you, whenever you're about to grab a snack food or something. Just ask yourself, just pause and check in and just say, am I hungry? And if not, then why am I doing this? Because so much of our behavior is just based on habit. And, and I do this. I go by the kitchen. I wasn't even hungry, but I just see something on the counter. Um, and I'm like, oh, that looks good. And I eat it. And I, it's not even necessary. I'm hungry. It's more of a habit. So just by pausing and checking in, that can have a big impact. I could have spent the entire lecture just on number three the entire time here. Um, and I'm going to spend two minutes on it, right? But um, this whole notion of mindful eating, practicing mindfulness, I, it, you know, number two already is along these lines. Um, but 
the mindfulness piece is is what I'm talking about is uh, in the land of emotions, right? So when you feel um, these strong emotions, our tendency is to want to escape. I mean, let's be honest, right? Who likes to feel anxious? Who likes to feel depressed? Who likes to feel lonely? Who likes to feel bored? And um, I, if I had time, I bet many of you would attest to the myriad of ways that when you feel one of those, you immediately try to do anything to escape it. Okay? And mindfulness kind of goes in the opposite direction. Rather than try to escape it, deny it, numb it, it's saying, okay, let's sit with it. <laughs> you know, let's acknowledge it. Let's say, I, I may not like feeling this way, but it is what it is, you know, I'm, uh, uh, let's, let's give it a name. You know, if you, if you grew up, um, many, uh, patients of mine grew up in households where emotions and feelings were not talked about. It is just kind of, you just stiff upper lip, you know, move on ahead, do what you need to do. Don't, don't complain. Don't talk about it. Don't whine. Don't cry. The emotion is just viewed as a negative thing. If you grew up in that way, then of course you you're not going to be very mature in your understanding of emotions. But you can't. I guarantee you, you can increase your knowledge and understanding of emotions as you start to um, to 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 make steps in this area. And one first step is actually even just to be able to name what it is you're feeling, because most times, even if someone feels bored or anxious. All they know is I feel really uncomfortable. I, 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 I don't like it. It's at that level. Whereas if you sit with it, you're like, huh, what's going on right now? Whew, man, I'm about to give this, you know, PowerPoint to a few hundred people. And man, I'm, I'm anxious. Wow. I'm, I'm nervous. And, you know, I'm just, I'm calling out, I'm just labeling it. And, um, that doesn't necessarily get rid of it, but it almost gives you, it, it, it gives permission for you to feel that way. Okay. It's, it's, it's not a part of yourself that you necessarily have to reject. Um, and, and then I encourage you to explore it. You know, it's like getting curious, huh? What, you know, what, what was the trigger for this, these most recent set of feelings? Oh, is it was this long day of work or, or is getting stuck in traffic or, it was a, a Saturday and Sunday where I feel like there's so much I want to get done, but I, I don't know where I where to begin. Um, and that makes me really uh, antsy inside. You know, you start to just uh, better understand what the trigger is. Um, and then even just sort of checking in, huh, how, how that emotion feels in your body. For, uh, for me, when I feel anxious, guess where I get it? I get it in my shoulders, right? I just unconsciously i'm at my computer like 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 this typing and i almost have to be oh okay wow it's carrying a lot and then just like take a pause relax my shoulders but people feel it some people feel stomach ache some people feel tension you know in 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 their their limbs their 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 legs or their arms i you know i don't know again for each person it's different but just by starting to understand better your experience of whatever emotion it is, whether it's anger, depression, boredom, bitterness, resentment, shame, guilt, you know, labeling it and accepting it, that is part of the, the whole mindfulness uh, practice. And in a nutshell, what you're doing is you're starting to learn more. You're uh, popping the hood, right? As I mentioned earlier, you're, you're popping the hood and seeing the inner goings on in yourself that maybe you have never really um, explored. Um, on a concrete level, as you start to practice this sort of mind, these mindful exercises, you're going to start to know your triggers. And at a simple level, there oftentimes are ways to strategize avoiding them. Okay. And, or, or dealing with them, you know, why not deal with the upstream triggers so that you don't get yourself in these uncomfortable states to begin with. Um, I've had some people talk to their bosses about cutting back on work hours because they realized their work stress was a major uh, trigger for them. 
I've had some people retire early because <laughs> they realized that their finances could um, support that and, and they didn't need to work as hard as they were. Um, I've had some patients uh, go uh, into couples therapy because they realize that it's their communication with their spouse that is a massive uh, trigger for them. And so they need to deal with that. Um, I've had some people work on their sleep hygiene because they realize that when they're tired um, and sleep deprived, that that's when they tend to be more vulnerable. And that's a trigger. You, you kind of get the idea. So for each person, it's going to be different, but you need to know your trigger um, and then develop strategies for whether you can uh, minimize those. Uh, despite all your efforts at dealing with your triggers, you may still find yourself emotionally, you know, uh, a strong wave of emotion. And then it becomes important to come up with alternative coping activities besides eating. You know, so whether it's going for a walk, um, where's my journal? Okay, this is my journal. All right. Like, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, th th this is a great outlet if you've got a lot going on ahead and sometimes just the process of writing it down can be helpful. So journaling, um, uh, praying, meditating, um, exercising, dancing, listening to music, talking to a good friend, right? All of those are probably activities that are more aligned with your optimal view of health than eating a, a burger and fries, right? But if you don't take the time to identify what those activities are for you, you're going to you're going to revert to the default, resort to the default, which has been eating. Um, I think it's helpful to create a plan for both before and after falling off the wagon. So remember what I that quote from Viktor Frankl, right? There's a, a moment uh, between stimulus and response and there is your freedom to choose. So there is a moment, especially if you start to practice to practice mindfulness. When you're going to start to realize, oh, I'm triggered. Oh, I'm feeling this emotion. Oh, I know that generally with that emotion, I go here. Okay, I've got, do I have a plan in that moment of temptation? It's like the Alcoholics Anonymous, right? They call their sponsor when they feel like they're about to have that, you know, glass of wine or that, that beer. And they have a, a intervention before they fall off the wagon. So I encourage my patients to have a plan for before to see if they can avert um, that relapse or falling off. But I also think it's equally, if not more important to have a, pro a plan for after you fall off the wagon, because so many of my patients use the fact that they ate off plan as, as, as an excuse to say, why bother? I couldn't do it. And then they're off and running. It's, it's as if they're um, you know, their little deviation during Thanksgiving justifies a whole year of eating unhealthy as opposed to, okay, yeah. So you had a little too much pumpkin pie during Thanksgiving, but then you got back on track, which is an equally valid uh, alternative. And I think we would all argue a much healthier one, right? So just having that plan in place for before and after makes a big difference. Monitor your thoughts and actions. Um, I really believe strongly in this. It, I can't, it's hard to control your feelings, right? If, if you're feeling anxious, I can't just say, stop feeling anxious, right? But you do have a lot more control over your thoughts and actions. And so as you start to monitor your thoughts and actions, you're going to hopefully start to see which thoughts are, are serving you well, and which thoughts are actually going against you and choosing to to expose yourself to thoughts that are, are, are better. And I'll show you a page of those after, uh, after this. And then also the actions, instead of um, engaging in eating, you can choose to engage in the healthier coping activity. So you may not have control over your emotions and don't, no, don't necessarily try to control them. Instead, just as, as that person I wrote, uh, wrote me in an email, I'm just trying to feel the feeling or be with it, right? So just let it, let it happen and and like it like a wave in the ocean it doesn't last forever that's that's the one thing every person says that no matter how hijacked they are this too shall pass it does pass so it's almost like you have to ride out that emotional roller coaster 
But in the meantime, take control over what you can control, which are your thoughts and your actions. Um, I'm a huge believer in reflection because it's through reflection that we turn failure into success. And I'm not just, that's not just some like lip service. I really believe it. I think that our greatest adversity can be a source of our greatest strength if we reflect on it, because then we can say what happened, where did things go wrong? And how do I change things so that going forward, um, I don't make that mistake again, or I, I go on a healthier uh, uh, trajectory. Um, this is a big beast to deal with. And I do think that professional help can be extremely helpful. It's very nice to have an objective uh, person outside of yourself that's hearing what you're going through, feeding it back to you and kind of giving you some, some perspective on, on all that you're uh, experiencing. Um, so whether it's through a uh, therapist or um, a psychiatrist or just some form of professional help that would suit you, um, I think that can be incredibly uh, beneficial. And then last, and I would argue that this is potentially um, the most important, is practice self-compassion. Talk back to that inner critic, right? Um, I have noticed that the one thing that connects virtually all emotional eaters together is how hard they are um, on themselves. They're very judgmental of themselves um, and uh, lots of feelings of inadequacy, lots of feelings of shame, um, lots of feelings at times of hopelessness, but most of that comes from them listening to this inner critic voice that says, oh, you can't do it. Why did you think you could? You're such a failure, right? Just this like, oh, this voice that's, I can't believe you fell off the wagon after months of success. It's just in your head, judging you, condemning you. And you just got to talk back to that. And, and instead, um, start to cultivate the voice of of the inner nurturer right the 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 person or the voice in your head that's encouraging you that no matter how much you slip is is kind of saying hey, it's okay we all slip up you know let's get back up let's get back up on our feet and let's go um and that's the voice of self-compassion so you know uh, just a, a couple of things. It's normal to have feelings like this. Everybody goes through difficult periods. Everyone has their own unique strengths and weaknesses. You're in the middle of a storm right now. Storms come and go. You're learning to be a deeply rooted tree that can withstand these storms. You don't know for sure what other people are thinking about you, right? We tend to try to mind read and project what other people are thinking without really truly knowing. Let's just take things one step at a time. Hey, sometimes we learn the most in life from our challenging periods, things like humility and perseverance. When you get through this trial, you're going to feel good about your effort and be a stronger person for it. If this is important to you, you can improve with practice. And this is one of my favorite quotes from this actress, Sophia Bush. You are allowed to be both a masterpiece and a work in progress simultaneously. It's just this idea that, you know, most people have this mentality coming into whether it's mastering diabetes or the McDougal program or anything. It's I am acceptable once or uh, on condition that I reverse this, you know, blood pressure or once I weigh a certain weight. And I think that's a very kind of, um, I think you're setting yourself up for a lot of, of turmoil and suffering. Uh, and I'm not saying it's easy, but if you can start to move more towards this idea that, hey, I am right now, as I am, the weight that I am, the medications that I'm on, I am acceptable. I'm okay. And at the same time, I am a work in progress. I'm going to continue to strive for more. If you can hold that dynamic tension, those people tend to have a much more fulfilling, meaningful, smoother, long-term sustainable journey um, than people whose sense of identity hinges upon whether they conquer this thing that they're trying to um, address. So here are a couple books, um, The Mindful Diet. Uh, it's a good one. Uh, Kristen Neff, she's the queen of self-compassion. Uh, I, I love her work. Um, so if you find that that's a thing, you, something you struggle with, that's a good one. Uh, when Food is Comfort by Julie Simon, another book I've read. I highly recommend it. 
Um, I have I have a lot of patients who uh, come from faith backgrounds. Um, this one's a Bible study, 40 day Bible study, freedom from emotional eating. Um, and so for people from religious backgrounds, whether it's Buddhist, um, uh, Jewish, uh, Christian, Seventh-day Adventist, I encourage them to draw upon their faith um, to help them uh, deal with some of these difficult to address issues. And ultimately, this is my last slide. My hope with patients is to, is to break them out of this vicious pattern or cycle of emotional eating that they feel just kind of is lifelong and brings them down, 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 um, and instead kind of bring them more to this virtuous cycle where their triggers are less frequent because they've addressed them. They've started to work on their way of thinking uh, and addressing the inner critic within instead replacing it more with an inner nurturer. Uh, even when they feel strong emotions with the urge to eat, they have now come up with adaptive or healthy behaviors that serve them much better. And with each time that they do this, they're strengthening those neural connections, those neural pathways. What, um, you know, the more they do it, the more it wires together and the stronger that that becomes the default. Then they, they feel these feelings of pride, the joy, achievement, encouragement. And, and now they're in this virtuous cycle where, yeah, sometimes they slip, sometimes they fall. But in general, they feel that with each passing week, month, year, not only are they coming closer to their health goals, but they're developing a healthier sense of self. They, they're developing a better understanding of themselves. They're developing a healthier relationship with food that's that's um, uh, much more based in a language of compassion than deprivation and and uh, condemnation. Um, and uh, overall, I just feel that this is a much more sustainable healthy and uh, fulfilling uh, journey. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Lim, um, I want to tell you the, the chat box has been, been fun to watch. And, you know, one of my favorite comments here comes from Jennifer. This doctor really cares. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Yes. <laughs> that's, the truth. that's the truth. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I, I do want to field some questions and I do want to have you share your, your personal story that you oh, yeah. wanted to share. Yeah. But before I, I do that, I, I do want to just, I want to turn my screen share on. Can you see my screen, Dr. Lim? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So I want you guys to know about this program. We talked about it a little bit in the beginning. Some of you might've come in late, maybe you didn't hear it, but um, Dr. John McDougall, and, and his wife and Dr. Lim and, and Jeff Novick and um, Dr. Lyle, like the team over at the, Dr. McDougal, like the McDougal wellness world is just spectacular. And we've been aligned for many years. And, you know, I feel like, you know, Cyrus and I kind of like stand on the shoulder of, of giants like Dr. John McDougal. And so I just cannot recommend this program enough. And so we talked about it again in the beginning, like, it's, tw it's a 12 day online event. And I think we'll, we'll maybe go through the schedule and we'll look at the details together, Dr. Lim, so people can understand like what's the experience. Yeah. But these are the dates, you know, you can plan in advance um, and commit and get your time off work. One thing that's really valuable here that you guys offer, Dr. Lim, is the ongoing medical care. So it's, it's you, you are there for 12 days, but then you can access you and the team for, for a year. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Well, they can access me and the team for life, uh, but you get actual structured support from um, uh, your support specialists. So it's going to be either Tiffany or Corey or Stacy, who all three of them are absolutely uh, amazing. And they check in with you. It's sort of an accountability support uh, partner. Um, they check in with you each day of the 12 day program. Then they check in with you weekly for the first couple months and then it spaces it out, but it's the whole year. Um, the, the other piece of it is that, uh, Dr. McDougall and I, um, just because of the huge number of patients in the McDougall program now over the 20 plus years, we only see patients, uh, through the, uh, former McDougall program patients. So those people who have done the program, have access to arrange appointments, follow-up appointments with myself or Dr. McDougall for, um, for life. So I, I, you know, in my schedule each week, um, I do I, one type of visit or my follow-up visits with former patients. But today, for example, I did five 
new consultations. Mm. And um, that's a nice feature for patients who are wondering, is this the right program for me? Right. Um, and so, you know, they pay uh, a $250 fee for the consultation. But if I, I give them the straight shot, I have told patients, I don't think you're a good fit. Um, most people are, but the w- ones who aren't necessarily good fit is when they have expectations that I just can't promise. <laughs> mm-hmm, for sure. I cannot promise that our diet will get rid of your metastatic cancer, right? right? right. And if that's what you need coming in, then it's probably not the right fit. Yeah. So if I had five appointments today and most of them were like, oh, wow, okay, this will be a good fit. And if they sign up for one of the programs, then the cost of the consultation is subtracted from the cost. So it's essentially a free consult. So that's, that's a nice... Good. Yeah. feature for if you just want to know, you know, what's Dr. Lim's overall take on my health? And um, does he think that this would be a good thing? for? Absolutely. Me? I love that. And yeah. again, I want to reiterate, like these are live lectures, which is very cool. Like it's live. It's not like you're watching recordings. And this team is incredible. Like Jeff Novick is a straight <laughs> up <man>. legend. <laughs> like, honestly, uh, John McDougall. I mean, Dr. Lim, who you're, you know, getting to experience tonight. Dr. Doug Lyle, The Pleasure Trap is just uh, fascinating. Um, Jack Dixon, and then you have Heather McDougall as well. So Heather McDougall is uh, Dr. McDougall's daughter, and like she knows the stuff inside and out. So the, the, the content is right on. And there's just a lot of stuff that you guys receive. But I, I want you to just like give me an example. Talk us through a day. Like, what, what is it like? What, what's the virtual experience? I, I can, I don't Yeah, this one, this, stay about. on this page. It's perfect. Yeah. Um, so you, Remember, I mentioned Tiffany or Corey or Stacy. You were assigned at the very beginning one of these three magnificent support specialists. They check in with you each morning. It's not necessary at 5 a.m., so don't worry. It, yeah. it, it ranges, but they have to check in with the number of patients. So it's going to be in the early morning. Um, there's always an, an informal meetup that's optional. This has been honestly the highlight for many patients. And from this, they have formed groups that have continued to stay on with each other thereafter because, like I said, we long for connection. Um, and so, uh, uh, it's a breakfast where people will get together, but it's optional. This is one of people's favorite highlights every morning. Um, Dr. John McDougall and Mary McDougall, his, uh, wife, um, cook extraordinaire, um, they do a, a informal Q and a, so you just get to spend every day with, uh, you know, an absolute legend and pioneer uh, yep. in this field. Fantastic. Um, there's always a morning lecture. So in this case, it was with Jeff Novick that mm. runs for about an hour, down and a half. Um, and there's always an afternoon lecture. So in this case, it was mine. I give one on behavioral change. Mm-hmm. Right. No surprise. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Um, and then sometimes we have this little informal chat in the afternoon, this chat. Right. Connects. So it's not, I mean, it's busy, but it's people have, there are people who are working during it. I don't recommend it. Honestly, I, uh, the people who have taken that time off work have been the happiest because yeah. it's not just about the food. It really is about kind of a whole life evaluation. Um, and we talk about sleep. We talk about movement. Jack Dixon does a great job on movement. Um, I talk a lot about behavioral change, emotional eating. Um, Doug Lyle talks a lot about the psychology uh, piece of it. Um, and, uh, there's just so much material that yeah. if people can get that time off, I think they, they enjoy it. And especially learning the cooking skills as well. For sure. And I also just want to say like this team, you guys are fun. Like Jeff Novick stuff is funny. You know what yeah. I mean? Like it's yeah. not like a boring, like, uh, like, you know what I mean? Like it's really people who care and entertaining and, and evidence-based information. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and this, the, this is the one I mentioned here. So you can book a consultation, directly right through that and that was yep. one like this morning i did five of those all new patients perfect okay great so um i i just cannot recommend this enough these are the dates so again you could join any one of them um you probably want to join before they fill up but um it's just a fantastic resource and we're really happy to share with you guys why don't you won't you tell your story i'm sure people want to hear that and then we'll answer any questions for with the, with the time that's left all right yeah um so this very computer that you see me in front of you with my messy, I, I've, I kind of have a background envy. I got to admit, Robbie, I want your background. <laughs> <laughs> I like your background, man. I know. <laughs> I'll, 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 uh, I'll trade you in a second. <laughs> but um, this very computer, this Mac computer that you see me in front of, um, the 
first few years as a medical director, I spent agonizing hours working on PowerPoints just like this. Um, and uh, I didn't realize it, but I've had a habit since I was a kid, which is when I am stuck working on something and I am not making progress. Uh, I don't, I'm not, a fa I am not, if you ever watch Dr. McDougal work, he's like a, I mean, he is a machine. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> done. I mean, he's famous for the like 20 minute turnaround time in emails. I, yeah. I, you know, I'm like, you know, give me like at least two days. I'm, I'm a plotter. I've just, hey, I've come to accept it. I am who I am, right? There you go. But uh, one of the challenges is I don't move fast. And so I have been stuck in working on papers in college or this or that. And my habit was when I was stuck, there's a lot of nervous energy and tension that's associated with that. And my go-to was food. It was food. Mm -hmm. um, so I am, I'm not exaggerating that in a given day, even as medical director of the McDougal program, I would easily get up 15 to 20 times out of this chair to go you know, 30 feet to the fridge or the cupboards and, and grab small amount of food. Not, I wouldn't need a huge whole meal. But I basically used it as a as a sort of a stress reliever. And um, I realized as I've kind of been delving in emotional eating that like, OK, great, fine. I, I'm not, you know, I'm not overweight. It's not that I'm eating. I would eat healthy foods. I go get an apple or I get some carrots and hummus. But it still was not to me an ideal behavior because I was using food for the wrong reasons. You know, yeah. I was using food to fill an emotional need. And the emotional need was one of distress because if I get down to the root of it, I'll just be totally honest with you all. It was a sense of inadequacy. I mean, mm. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Yeah. I felt like here I am plant-based professional. I've been stuck for the last half hour on a single slide and I have no words mm. <laughs> on the page. <laughs> Meanwhile, you know, so-and-so has like produce this, 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 you engage in the comparison game. Yeah. Before you know it, you feel like a piece of dung. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's not a comfortable feeling to sit with who wants to feel that way. I need to distract myself. I'm going to go get food. I mean, that's a really a pretty, yeah. You know, I mean, thing, you, you're yeah. basically, I mean, you're describing what you talked about in your presentation, which is you, you had the slide of like, okay, is the, there was a side-by-side -side comparison. Like, are you eating for this reason or that reason? Or right. like, is, is, exactly. is the experience like after the meal this or is it this? Yeah. And it makes sense. So that was my first step was awareness. Uh, it took me, I'm 45 years old as of, you know, just over a week ago. Um, it, it, it took me, what, 30 plus years before I realized this aspect of my behavior. Um, and I realized I don't, I don't want that anymore. I, I want to eat food because I enjoy it and because I'm hungry, not, not because I'm trying to find some way of dispersing nervous energy and uncomfortable emotions. So with the awareness, then the next step is, well, okay, what next? Um, well, first I can try to work on the trigger and try to, you know, find ways of being less of a perfectionist, getting material out there, not, you know, having it be perfect, all, all that. So that's fine. But, but despite that, the feelings are still going to come up and how am I going to deal with them? And so I came up with my list. I literally came up with my list of, of my alternative coping tools aside from going and eating food. Um, by the way, I want to say, I remember distinctly when I was undergoing this period of transformation, my patients were making fun of me because I'm kind of an open book. As I'm doing things, I'm just yes. like, I'm being transparent. I, yeah. feel, I find that that's just my style. And so like, oh, Dr. Lim, like emotional eating, getting an apple. And, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, 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 I get it. But that's not the point. The point is I'm, I, I want to be my best self and I, I, I want to feel like I'm handling adversity in a healthy way. And so I literally made a sense, a list of what to me is dealing with this adversity in a healthy way. And so one was um, going out in nature um, and, mm. or for a walk. Uh, nature is my, uh, it's where I feel most Zen and myself, I feel almost like, and there's studies to show this, by the way, nature and its effect on our stress load, those trees, those mountains, those rocks, it literally sucks my stress away. Mm -hmm. Um, and, or, or at a minimum taking my dog Balto, who's right here and going for a five minute walk. That was one. The second was, um, you know, 
journaling. I would just kind of write a quick note and just the process of getting it out on paper that that was helpful, but more aligned. Um, and then the third, uh, you know, for me, faith is the center of my life. Um, mm. So I'm, I'm Christian and I realized that um, I wanted to bring my uncomfortable feelings to God uh, rather than use food as my numbing agent. And so I literally, this right where you see me, I would get on my knees um, mm. and I'd pray and I'd it would basically be saying, Lord, um, I am feeling anxious. I am feeling inadequate right now. And I, I, all I want to do is go get some food and instead, Lord, I just, I give it, I give it to you. And I pray that you give me strength to deal with this in a healthier way. And I just surrender it. I just surrendered yeah. it. And, uh, you know, I know I can honestly say emotional eating is no longer an issue for me. I mean, do I still sometimes do that? Yeah. But remember what I talked about at the beginning? It's mm -hmm. not that all oh, emotional is horrible. It's really the frequency with which you do it. Yeah. It's whether that is your soul coping tool. Um, it's your overall health. And, and yeah. I may do it every now and then, but I, I, it is not my primary coping mechanism. And that is, that's incredibly empowering, even though my weight hasn't changed, you know, even though my no, no numerical value shows any difference, but in terms of just how I feel as a person, I feel much better. You know? I, I was so happy to see that slide because, I mean, you know, that's something that Cyrus and I have been saying for a long time, that everybody is an emotional eater. Like if you're human, <laughs> you have emotions, you have experiences, you're going to use food. And, and, and you, you that slide, I really think, is it just nailed it in the sense of it, it's, it's like a continuum. Right. And, and everybody is always at any moment, you know, checking in with themselves and and deciding what, what do I want to do better? How can I improve? Where do I want to move on this continuum? How much is it impacting my life? Do I need help? And, you know, for you, you're sharing an example of, oh, you know what? I just, you know, eating that extra apple, I, I want to be my best self. Somebody was yeah. just like celebrating that in the comments. Like, it's just a self-awareness. Right. Self-awareness. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, I, I love the resources you provided. I mean, I remember one learning from in the early days, you know, a health guru was like, look, like, make a list of a hundred things you will, you will do with this energy, with this health that you're seeking. And that's kind of like a journaling example. Like you go to the journal, you write these things instead of going and, and eating the food that, that's right. not serving you in alignment with your goals. But yeah. you provided a, lot, a heck of a lot more options than just that. Yeah, exactly. And you know, it's, uh, when I talk to patients about my goal for them, you know, because if I ever ask people to wave their wand, they'll always say, Literally, I asked one patient today what if she could wave her wand, what it would it be? And it was that she weighed a certain weight, right? Which is mm -hmm. very common. Or I reverse my diabetes and I reverse my heart disease. I think that's all great. But but I always say if I could wave my magic wand, that's not what I would wish for, believe it or not. And they're like, What? And I say, My sign of progress for you as a patient is the degree to which your your daily thoughts, actions, behaviors aligns with your deepest values and, and, and who you are. Mm. Be, you know, is there a disconnect in certain areas of your life? And the more that we achieve what I call congruency, right? Or alignment, or, or as a patient recently told me, cohesion uh, in, in not just one aspect, but all these aspects of our lives, then I know that the rest will follow. You know, if you have inner congruency and alignment, then you're you're gonna make healthier choices and and you're gonna get down to a healthier weight and you're you're gonna get off of medication. But if you just if I wave my wand and you get down to a weight, I haven't necessarily fixed any of the underlying thoughts, actions, mm. behaviors that got you to that place mm. in the first place. And guess what? Would any of us be surprised if one year later you were right back to where you were? No one would be. That's right. why diets so often fail, and that's why gastric bypass surgery is not a fix, right? Because you don't, you don't surgically remove those unhealthy behavioral thought patterns. It's powerful. It's a very powerful distinction. And I remember seeing in the chat box, it was very, very early. I don't, I don't even know if I can get back to it, but some person was saying that, you know, I've lost 40 pounds. I've been doing this for many, many years. Like I'm a long-term success story. And that's what we're focused on. That's what I know your team um, everything you do with the Dr. McDougall programs and resources is all about long-term success, you know, you know, not calorie restriction, like not these short-term fixes. It's like long-term, long-term, 
um, you know, truly being satisfied, but also beyond like the physical food, the, the mental component. I really, like you said this in your presentation, it's not talked about enough. It's not addressed enough, not enough resources. And I'm just really happy to see you guys providing this. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I, at the graduation that we had yesterday, you know, in addition to those statistics, uh, you know, those patients who have reversed their illness, um, one patient talked about how she realized the impact of growing up with an alcoholic father, mm. how that uh, impacted her. And that was huge for her. Um, she, uh, she got a book by Claudia Black. She even mm -hmm. told me the name. It will never happen to me. Um, all about uh, growing up with alcoholic parents. And mm. she started reading it. And it's just like whew, wow. opening up uh, all these insights. And for her, that was just bigger than any weight loss, you know, and that's the kind of thing. Or, or another one who um, uh, talked about uh, the, the challenges of dealing with her in-laws and the impact that that had their sort of judgment of, of her figure and how that led to disordered eating, disordered eating patterns. And just that recognition and awareness um, is going to really help her as she, because she's been someone who has yeah. yo-yo dieted forever. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up. I mean, that's just one example of endless topics that are, you know, maybe taboo to talk about or, you know, embarrassing or too hard. Just like this, there's a lot of these challenging things that are happening that are real. And it's not just about, okay, here's the information of what to do and, and follow these food rules or guidelines. Like we have to address these bigger issues. Absolutely. I was seeing, uh, just, I was kind of perusing the chat box and, yeah. um, just a couple of things that came up. I, I love this one. It's so funny because someone put like, if you use chopsticks uh, for eating slowly, Kara brought this up. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm Chinese, right? You're right. Ch try learning to use chopsticks because you can only eat a little bit at mm -hmm. a time. Mm -hmm. You know, a couple, couple grains of rice versus my mm -hmm. shovel method if I'm using a fork or a spoon. Yeah. Um, so, so that's a good thing. Um, sure. And then also someone asked, that, is there a difference between mindful eating versus being intentional it, intentionality is very much part of mindfulness right that it's mm -hmm. the awareness and then it's also the intentionality you know kind of thinking about what you're doing and whether that's aligning with uh, what you want actually want to do um and uh let's see i don't know if any other yeah there was one other question i want to we'll ask there's one question i definitely want you to answer um and then we'll, we'll probably head out here but I also want to say how this, this concept of eating slowly is incredibly important for blood glucose management. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're insulin resistant in the beginning and you're, you're starting to you know, lower your fat intake, increase your carbohydrate intake, you don't become insulin sensitive overnight. It's a process. So in that process of becoming more insulin sensitive, you, you want to avoid seeing high blood glucose readings or spikes of any sort. And eating slowly is one of the best ways you can do that especially in the beginning and long-term as well. That's for people living with all types of diabetes and for type any insulin dependent type, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a challenging game. We, we are trying to match the carbohydrate we're eating with the insulin that we manually inject. And it's not as pristine as non diabetic people who are living without diabetes. Like this is, it's a very, it's a very different than like the, the micro doses that the, your natural body can take and, and give you perfect blood glucose. Like that's what you have, Dr. Lim. But when you're like injecting exogenous insulin with this big dose, it's, it's just not the same. So right. you, you have even more motivation and more reason to manipulate your length of eating in order to keep that blood glucose more stable. Absolutely. So I love that chopsticks. Yeah. Advice. <laughs> one, one question which came up, uh, which I think is very important to address as we wrap up is, is this an all or nothing black or white? Um, mm. approach. And um, I, I, I'll be, you know, it's kind of funny. Dr. McDougal is kind of an all or nothing black or white fire and brimstone. <laughs> and if you can't tell, I'm more of a shades of gray um, mm -hmm. and, you know, different strokes for different folks. Yeah. But I, I, I think at the end of the day, you got to know yourself, to be honest, mm. you got to know yeah. yourself. Um, and so anything that is black or white in someone's mm -hmm. life, I never want it to be because Dr. Lim said so. Because that just doesn't work. P people, once they feel restricted, they just want to, you know, oftentimes 
rebel. <laughs> um, so if they have some all like I cannot, I will not eat this. I will. I really want it to come from uh, within. Um, mm. In general, I am a believer that it's what we do ninety percent of the time that is is what matters and i feel like that's the lesson we got from the blue zones right mm, that 90 yeah. percent of the food is fruits vegetables legumes and whole grains but um it's not like it was they were perfect angels right yet they still were able to enjoy really good health our body is fairly resilient but you got to be honest with yourself if you think you're doing 90 percent, but you're overweight or obese with meds there's you're you're not right? Yeah. You're, you're not, you may think you are, but you're not. And if for a period of time, you need to be all or nothing, like, you know what, um, I just am not going to have anything with added sugar for the next few months, just so I totally, you know, get rid of it. And, and say, you know, it's a temporary thing versus like, I will never have this food again. Mm -hmm. um, then then maybe that works better for you. Because one of the challenges with all or nothing is that if you deviate from an all or nothing, then it leads to this sense of, well, why bother? I've, yeah. I've, I'm either doing it or I'm not. And usually yeah. what I say is, well, okay, you're not doing as much, but that doesn't mean you have to throw out the, you know, throw out everything. So yeah. I don't know if that answers your all or nothing question, but that's my take on it. I think, that, I mean, it's a, a great point. And I think a great way to uh, end it. Uh, if there's any questions that we did not get to answer, we apologize, but I cannot recommend booking this consultation. Uh, it is absolutely, I mean, I, how long are the calls with you, Dr. Lim? They're scheduled for, uh, th about half an hour. Uh, That's they often great. go, they often go over yeah. uh, one of them today went an hour. So uh -huh. I, I bottom line is I take yeah. as long as is necessary. That's great. That's great. Okay. So, uh, if, if you're ready for the program, I mean, just sign up. If you're not sure, I think the consultation is a brilliant, brilliant idea and a, a wonderful investment. So I'll paste the link again. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Lim. Thank you for everything you do. You're a huge inspiration. And I uh, can't wait to finally hang out again in person yeah, when, when the time is it, right. It's good to see your face. <laughs> awesome. Thanks Thank for you. Doing Have this. a good night, everybody. Thanks right. for joining us. Bye. Bye.